The scene that we're about to watch together affected me deeply. Really deeply. I cried. Did I say I cried? No, I wept. I'll tell you why. If anyone has suffered physically with disabilities, pain, suffering, chronic illnesses, I think you can understand where I'm coming from. And we'll talk about this. We'll talk about why God lets suffering and pain happen, go through health issues and heartache. There's a reason. And let's talk about that after the clip. So stay tuned. Master. Little James. May I have a moment? Of course. I am. Um... Forgive me, I'm uh, not always confident to speak. Slow to speak. It's a very good quality. <laughs> <clears throat> I wanted to ask you a question. Please? So you're sending us out with the ability to heal the sick and lame. Yes, that, that is what you said. Yes. So you're telling me that I have the ability to heal. <laughs> Forgive me, I just find that difficult to imagine with my condition, which you haven't healed. Do you want to be healed? Yes, of course, if, if that's possible. I think you've seen enough to know it's possible. Then why haven't you? Because I trust you. What? Little James. Precious little James. I need you to listen to me very carefully. Because what I'm going to say defines your whole life to this point and will define the rest of your life. Do you understand? In the Father's will, I could heal you. Right now. And you'd have a good story to tell, yes? Yes, that you do miracles. And that's a good story. But there are already dozens who can tell that story. And there will be hundreds more, even thousands. But think of the story that you have, especially in this journey to come, if I don't heal you. To know how to proclaim that you still praise God in spite of this to know how to focus on all that matters so much more than the body. To show people that you can be patient with your suffering here on earth because you know you'll spend eternity with no suffering. Not everyone can understand that. How many people do you think the Father and I trust this with? Hmm? Not many. The others, there's so much more. So much more what? I don't know, stronger, better at this. James, I love you, but I don't want to hear that ever again. I know how easy it is to say the Song of David that I fearfully and wonderfully made, but it doesn't make this any easier. And in this group, it doesn't make me feel like any less of a burden. A burden? First of all, it is far easier to deal with your slow walking than it is to deal with Simon's temper. <laughs> Trust me. Are you fast? Do you look impressive when you walk? Maybe not. But these are things the father doesn't care about. 
you are going to do more for me than most people ever dream. So many people need healing in order to believe in me. Or they need healing because their hearts are so sick. That doesn't apply to you. And many are healed or not healed because the Father in Heaven has a plan for them which may be a mystery. And we remember what Job said. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When you pass from this earth and you meet your Father in Heaven, where Isaiah promises you will leap like a deer, your reward will be great. So hold on a little longer. And when you discover yourself finding true strength because of your weakness, and when you do great things in my name, in spite of this, the impact will last for generations. Do you understand? Yes. Thank you, Master. A man like you, healing others. <laughs> oh, what a sight. I can't wait to hear your stories when you return. Shalom, my son. Shalom. And James. Remember. You will be healed. It's only a matter of time. At least I held it together a little bit better that time. That scene means a lot to me. Because like James, I have suffered my entire life. Ever since I was a child, I remember being in pain. And when I was 21 years old, we discovered that I was missing the top part of my spine. That explained the pain I was in. Up in C1 and C2, I was missing part of C1. It's called the odontoid process. I basically didn't have one. It's a little bone. This is uh, C1, has a little collar. And C2 has the odontoid process, a, a bone that sticks up into the collar allowing most normal people to turn their necks. Well, I didn't have one. It either didn't develop or it got snapped off. Point is, it was allowing C1 to slip into my spinal cord. Kind of dangerous. So dangerous that I could have been paralyzed at any point. And I was a crazy kid. I'd run headlong into our couch. I'd, you know, run up against walls. I'd wrestle with my friends and thank goodness I didn't play football. But I did play saxophone. I hung a big tenor sax around my neck. And I was in pain all my life. And then we found out why. When I went full body numbness, like tactile, I couldn't feel the surface of things. We got two or three opinions. And finally, a neurosurgeon said, you have os odontoidium, which is the missing of the odontoid process, that little bone. And fast forward, before I knew it, I was having reconstructive neck surgery. They sliced open the back of my neck. They took a piece of my own hip, harvested my own bone. And they attempted to fuse me from C1 to C2 vertebra. However, and oh, I wore a halo, okay? Big, one of those big metal halo braces. Look them up. Halo brace. Real fun. 
for three months. At the end of those three months, we found out, guess what? Didn't take. You're not fused. Fast forward, I get married to a lovely woman. After our honeymoon, I'm right back on the operating table again. This time, they took another piece of my hip out, removed C1. And with that piece of the hip, they made two bone triangles, if you will, with titanium wires wrapped around C2 up to the base of my skull, where they drilled holes and in, in, affixed the bone to the base of my skull, bypassing C1 and trying to create a stable block out of bone and titanium wires. Crazy. And I wore a halo brace again. Again, remember, I just got married. I just got back from my honeymoon. And I'm in a giant metal halo brace for three months. I couldn't take showers. It had a wool vest strapped to me in the middle of summer. It was it was a joy. Changed everything. That. Th that changed everything. My life would never be the same. Never has been the same. <laughs> I've been blessed to have a wonderful woman as my wife. We have four amazing children. And guess what? I'm not dead and I'm not paralyzed. Count your blessings. I know I do. And because I'm not dead and not paralyzed, I'm still here. Do I suffer every day? Yeah. And did I go through many, many years lost, angry? But it turns out I was missing something. Putting my faith 100 and holy percent in God. I've been a Christian since I was 14. That's when I was baptized. <laughs> But that doesn't mean that you always put everything with God. And I was angry and depressed. I lost my job, my dream career. And, and these were dark years. And it wasn't easy, still isn't easy. I still suffer from chronic pain. And of course, who hasn't asked the question? I know I have. Why? Why, Lord, do you let this happen? Why is this happening to me? Why was I born this way? It's a good question. You know, it's a good question. And there's an answer. And with all answers, the best place to look for them it's God's word. That was the other thing that I was missing. Giving everything to God. Trusting that he let me go through this. And is letting me go still go through these trials and tribulations and personal health issues and suffering. Knowing, though, that when he allows this to happen... It is our chance to lean on him even more, to grow even closer to him, to go deeper into his word for answers, to constantly and fervently pray, and to put him forefront and, and let him lead us and let his son Christ lead us because we are in him as Christians. That's the only answer. And, and so many things in life can be solved. Depression, anxiety, anger issues, and even pain and suffering on the physical level can be coped with daily and hourly by trusting the creator who made us and then allows us to then suffer through Things that are above and beyond the norm. And what was so brilliant about the scene from The Chosen that we just watched is 
you know, when he talks about how, you know, there are many, many stories, but yours is unique. And also God allows, I want to use the right terminology, but it is a select few, if you will, that suffer and ex physically above and beyond the normal, if you will. It's not everybody that wakes up in pain and goes to bed in pain. I know what that's like. And if you're like me, I share you, your struggle. And I know what you're going through. And there's a way out. There's a brighter path. And Jesus is the life and he's the light and he's the door and he's our shepherd. And he is everything. Jesus is the head of the church in both earth and heaven. He is God and he walked among us. And when we lean completely and wholly upon him, because we are in him as Christians, you know, we are supposed to die to ourselves. And when we die to ourselves, we are then become like and in Christ. Again, let's turn to God's word because that is vital and important in this hour. In Philippians 4, 4 through 7, it starts off by saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Not that I complain for want. This is Paul speaking, of course, and Paul knows a little bit about suffering, right? Um, the amount of times he was put in prison, and, and, and he's saying, Not that I complain for want, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of having plenty and hunger, abundance and want. You hear, you hear what he's saying? That's an even keel. And only true faith and trust and leaning on God 100% can give us that. No matter what happens, life goes up and down and up and down and we're battered and we're bruised. But there's a constant there. And that constant is our creator. And when we have a relationship with him, with our creator, we can find a balance through all those those valleys, like a waveform of audio. And he sums that up. This is Philippians 4, 4 through 7. In verse 7, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Romans 5, 3 through 5. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. Yeah. A beautiful soul that I had the privilege of knowing. A Miss Lee Fowler. She was in our church and, um, Anyway, I was blessed to know this lady, and she talked about how suffering and the trials we go through are, are blessings. And as a kid, that struck me as like, what? How can suffering and the trials we go through, the temptations and the slings and the arrows that are thrown at us be blessings? This is what it is. Listen to this. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And Paul talks a lot about the race, right? He he uses that metaphor a lot about the race, and and endurance is another kind of nod to that having the endurance to complete this race because at that finish line is heaven are the pearly gates, and again, endurance produces character, and can, character produces hope. And so many of us who have suffered like this physically, or suffer with anxiety, depression health issues, pain. 
we lose hope real quick. It can happen within the hour. You can be feeling good one hour and the next hour you're slammed with pain. You're slammed with some kind of physical event that makes you feel completely awful, unable to face the day. And you lose hope real quick, don't you? I know. I struggle with that every day. I do it pretty well these days, but I've come a long way. There were days in the past years where I'd wake up in pain and my day was shot. All hope gone. How can, how, you know, the, how can this be my life? You lose hope. And when you lose hope, there's not much to hold on to anymore. And that's where Satan's knocking at the door. When you don't have hope, and you start losing, you start losing sight of the light that we should be, you know, reaching towards. Then Satan is knocking at the door. Um, I, I I think about God talking to Cain, and talking about how his count, you, when your countenance has fallen, you know, your your facial expression, you know, how your your demeanor, how you are, when it's fallen, that's when Satan comes a knocking. So true. Okay. In maintaining the joy and, and, and that, that, that inner peace that only the Holy Spirit can give us, that is key to success. Jesus specifically addressed this subject matter in John 16, 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. It will, won't it? We were not promised a perfect life. We were not promised an easy life. Quite the opposite. Jesus, Paul, others, James, the Gospels, and throughout the New Testament, speak specifically of the trials that we will go through. And know this. Know that if you're a Christian and you're watching this and you're understanding what I'm saying, that um, Satan will come for you first. He's got everyone else. Satan always goes for the first. He goes for the ones that are closest to God. You know why? Because he wants to take us out. He wants to take us out from at the church level to the personal level. He wants to take out the best. It's a huge victory for him. He gets minor victories all day long for those who already have lost hope. For those who are not in Christ and haven't been baptized and are Christians, he's already got them. <laughs> he's already got them. But he comes for us, okay? Don't let that happen. Keep your countenance. Keep it full of joy. Hold on to the hope. It's vital. It's vital to success. Luke 22, 31 through 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you. This is Jesus talking to Peter. Luke 22, 31, 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that, you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you in that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. This doesn't tie directly to us. There were events in that specific day and days that never happened before and never will happen again. Satan had had a temporary victory, didn't he? The forces of evil, Satan and his armies and the demonic forces were never more compressed into one zone in time than when the days leading up to the crucifixion and then the death of Jesus on the cross. That is Satan's finest hour, if you will. Okay, for him. All right? The forces of evil have never prevailed and have never been stronger than those moments. And, and Satan wanted Peter. Okay? And temporarily, Satan got him. Not, though, in a, in a grand kind of huge way, but that he did deny Christ three times. And he wept bitterly for that after her word, didn't he? Um, but... You have to give the guy a little bit of rope there because, again, whew, Satan was having his hour, meaning God let him have that hour. 
But <laughs> the joyful, amazing part of this is that in that victory, uh, he got to kill God's son. Okay? Woo. Satan got to put him on a cross, scourge him, mock him, mar march him through the streets, nail him to a cross, put a crown of thorn on his heads, beat him and batter him. He got to do all of this to God's only son, who is in human form, by the way. And I know Satan doesn't like that. To my knowledge, Satan has never had specific human form. So there, you know, anyway, I just don't think he likes the human form. Okay, we are God's masterpiece. So the point is, in that those hours leading up to in the death of Jesus, Satan was, man, he was having a victory lap. This is huge. But he was just a pawn, wasn't he? The victory always and will always, forever, lie with God. And God had a masterful plan. And I thank our Lord Jesus for having the bravery and, and the courage to face that cross. He could have called 10,000 angels, but no, he obeyed his Father's will. And isn't that another amazing lesson in which he's shown us, obeying our Father, our Heavenly, our heavenly Father. And, and, and the victory came three days later when he rose from that grave. He's the firstborn among the dead. He came back first, much like many other, you know, all everyone else will when he returns again, come back from the dead. So that was Luke 22, 31, 32. James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Again, this is talking more about endurance and steadfastness in our faith and in full effect, being perfect and complete. Yes, no, God does not expect us to be perfect. However, isn't that the highest calling one can imagine for our lives? to For us to strive towards perfection? Okay, and just as Jesus uh, spoke, said when he said, "Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect," um, we we are st we are to strive to this unattainable goal, and that always gives us something to reach towards, something to run towards. Um, that is the goal: is to strive towards perfection. No, we are made perfect in Christ through baptism, and when we join the the, the kingdom of God. Christ then bears our sins and we are made perfect through him and in him. But no, we personally, we, we are nothing. We cannot save ourselves. Okay? Only in Christ, by being a baptized believer and, and Christian, can we obtain true perfection. And then in that perfection, through and in Christ, can we then have eternity with the blessed Holy Holy Father, there is one only eternal Holy Father, our Father in heaven. Okay, this is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So, we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. Because we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This puts in perspective our daily struggles in this mortal coil, okay, in this physical realm. All right? Eternity is unseen. That's faith. And the things that we see are all temporary. Okay, as Paul describes it more than once, I believe is in first or second Peter, this is all destined to burn. Okay, the entire known physical universe will be burned at the atom, completely and utterly destroyed. It's all saved up for fire. However, a new heaven and a new earth or heaven awaits us. Okay, and that is currently our unseen, but this physical realm, but back to the physical part though. Uh, do not lose heart, 
We know our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed every day. Yeah. The moment we are born, we essentially begin to die. There is a time clock on every cell in our body. And at a certain point, um, we start to, we start wasting away and we, when we slip into uh, in death eventually. That is what our bodies are meant to do. And some of us feel this more than others, don't we? Some of us feel the, the daily pain and the daily grind, the aches, and they only get worse with age. And, 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 and my heart goes out to every one of you who knows what I've suffered, okay? Since childhood, I've known about pain, and I still suffer with it now, and it's only getting worse. And I know this scripture, oh, th this applies directly. Uh, yeah, our, our, our outer nature is wasting away. Boy, don't I know it. But that hope for eternal life, the peace that comes only by knowing Christ and from the Holy Spirit, that renews our inner nature every day every hour. And when you give it to God, it can do that for us. And finally, this is Romans 8, 28 through 39. We know that in everything, God works for the good of those who are in him, who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that we might have a firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. And to those who he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Can any of that separate us? For it is written, For thy sake we are all being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing. Nothing can get us. Nothing can stop us. We are victorious in Christ, and God has already won. The battle, the war is over. It's over. We just have to decide right now, this very hour, whose team we're going to be on. It's the easiest pass-fail test ever. Okay? Deciding whose team. Are we going to side with God? Are we going to be with his son? In his son? In Jesus Christ? In the Lord's body? Or for the other team? The other team is destined for outer blackness. The other team is destined for an eternity of pain and fire. You have Two teams to choose. And it is a choice. And we have free will. And even when we don't make a choice, we're still making a choice, aren't we? So I pray that you guys will make the right choice. And if you're suffering out there and you need prayers, let me know. Leave comments below. We can talk. I'd love to talk. And I pray that God's word will help you, guide you. Make sure you pray every hour and lean on God. And if you're not baptized, please do so. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. And if you haven't, if you want to subscribe, that'd be great too. This is Loud Boy. Thank you for joining me. I'm looking forward to season four of The Chosen. And until next time, God bless you guys. Thanks. Bye.